All righty. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our next episode of the GovCon Coffee and Issues show, and actually our last episode for 2023. And wow, this year has gone by so fast, but I'm happy to welcome back, of course, our co-host Michael Lejeune with RSM Federal. But with that, I would like to welcome a special guest. Today, we have Mr. Justin Sykin, he's the founder at HireGov, and you can find out more about HireGov at www.hiregov.com. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can see everybody a little bit better here. And welcome to the show, Justin. Thanks, Kyle. Appreciate you for inviting me today. Absolutely. So Justin and I met just recently, but kept seeing on, on uh, some Google searches that I was doing this higher gov kept popping up. So, you know, one day I went to check it out. So and I recently signed up for a, a subscription myself of the platform. I think Justin's doing some really cool things. And especially as it relates to the topic that we're going to be covering today, which is this industry saying that we hear a lot of People say if you're waiting for it to hit SAM.gov, it may be too late for you. But Justin, before we hop into the meat of today's session, can you give folks a little bit of a background on who you are, where you came from, and why you launched HireGov? Sure. So uh, HireGov provides market intelligence to contractors, grant recipients, and government agencies to help them find and win awards. Serve everyone from first-time contractors to companies with more than $5 billion a year in annual awards. We launched a little over a year ago. We already have around companies representing about $40 billion in annual federal awards on the platform. My background is in is an M&A. I sold 25 or so companies uh, worth more than $10 billion over a period of five years or so. And really, the impetus between HireGov was really taking those best practices from those companies that had grown from nothing to $100 million plus in revenue and put that into a data and software platform to help both you know new companies sort of figure out what they're you know figure out how to approach the market and then to help more established companies you know really kind of automate a lot of the stuff that they're doing you know manually or in, in spreadsheets now awesome well hey i can't wait to uh, hear some tips from you here today as it relates to the topic so again today our topic is really about this thing you might have heard out there maybe you haven't if you're new to govcon but i've heard this repeated a lot over the years is that if you're waiting for solicitation to hit SAM.gov, it's probably too late. Now, I will say that that probably is not true 100% of the cases. And I don't know, Justin, you might know from an analytics standpoint, if there's been some empirical evidence that's kind of showed us percentage. But Michael, I know you've heard this, we've uh, talked about it a little bit before. What I'd like to do, uh, Michael and, and Justin, and, and Michael, I'll go to you first, is that Michael, what are your thoughts on this particular statement as you hear this and where do you see that applies? What percentage of the time do you think, uh, just in your head, uh, or if you maybe know for sure, might that apply to and in which situations? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's spot on. And we know this because when you sit down and go through like the bid, no bid process, and people start answering the questions most of those questions are a no, like, I don't know who this customer is. I've never heard about this opportunity. I don't know anything about the opportunity. Don't even know if we could do, we just happened to do a search on Sam and some stuff showed up and you know, that's where this came from. Otherwise I'd have never known about it. And so when you look at things from the business world, it's always like, what's our chances of winning? In fact, one of our featured webinars in federal access this month is about proposal best practices. And like one of the sentences that right out of the gate is just because you can, doesn't mean you should when it comes to bidding on something, right? Just because you can bid on it doesn't mean you should bid on it. Because if you don't understand the customer, if you don't understand their problems, if you don't have a relationship with them, you know, and they don't understand your reputation, there's all these different little factors that play in. Now, can you blindly win an RFP? Yes, you can. But when I sit down and look at clients who are bidding and they're bidding at volume, you know, they're doing 10, 15, 20 RFPs a month, I'll sit down and say, well, what is your conversion rate? How many of those are you actually winning? And the odds are for most people, it's between five and 8%. That's pretty low because they're like, it's just, they're playing the numbers game of if I just keep playing, eventually I'll win something. Mm -hmm. And while that's true, wouldn't you rather reduce the 20 RFPs a month 
down to three or four that you know you have an 80 plus percent chance of winning. And the only way to do that is by being able to answer yes to a lot more of those questions. Yes, we know the customer. We've been talking to them about this. We've been tracking this opportunity for months, if not years. We've built a teaming relationship around this the last six months versus it popped up this morning. It's due on Friday and we know we can't prime it, but we're going to roll the dice or we're going to beg somebody to jump on a team with us that doesn't even know us because we haven't done that homework yet. And so can you win by just seeing something on Sam? Yes, you can. But the odds are it's only going to be at volume doing a lot more of it instead of being very selective about what you approach. And the thing is, you and I have talked about this in almost every podcast, every webinar, everything we ever do, Carol. You and I always talk about how Sam usually only has the scraps or the crumbs. Mm -hmm. So if all you're basing your business model on is what's rolling out on Sam, you're only looking at 15, 20% of the opportunities, depending on who you're targeting, it could be more. You're only looking at the crumbs of what's out there in the government market. There's so much out there that's never going to go the Sam route because of a contract vehicle or relationship, a sole source opportunity. You know, you'll see it on Sam, but it's a notice to award. It's not an RFP that you can respond to. So I, I think all of that combined, if that's your business model, you're missing out on a huge amount of stuff and you've got to do a lot more work than you should because your effort's not in the right place. So, so that, that's my soapbox on this topic. Yeah. So. Yeah. And we've had a whole discussion on previous shows where it's like one issue being you're not even seeing any like a lot of the opportunities because what you mentioned with the fact that lots going through these awarded contract vehicles over a five year period, like there's a lot that the government packs into those that does not ever get seen by the general public, you know, for one. Mm -hmm. Then for two, you've got things, anything under 25K might fall on their micro purchase threshold. Those are not going to hit Sam. So the visibility by itself is one of the, the issues, right? And so, but then when they do see it, yeah, absolutely. Everything you said, I've actually also have, have seen that before as well. And know that, you know, Josh talks about that on some of his webinars and that pre-acquisition work, that pre-acquisition engagement to be able to do what you can to engage any way you can to maybe get into a conversation, learn more about the contract or learn more yeah. about the contract. And so sometimes that's not always that easy to do, but you know what? Right. It's not easy. So, well, and, and I think part of the reason why people don't do some of those pre-acquisition activities is they don't know they should be doing it or how to do it properly because once you've tried to call a contracting officer two, three, four times, you've emailed them two, three, four times, it gets really frustrating when you don't have any responses back. And people think, well, I've done it three or four times. There's clearly no interest. And it's not that they don't have interest. It's that they have 250 other emails in their inbox. Their voicemail has 65 messages on it, you know, if it'll hold that, right? And, yeah. and it's like they're trying to get through the stuff, but just because they don't answer doesn't mean they're not interested. It just means they haven't gotten to it or your approach has been such that they don't even know what you're asking. I think I was talking to you earlier today about the whole Billy Madison scene where, uh, because I was talking to this one person and it's the scene in Billy Madison where they're doing the debate. And after the, after Billy's done talking, the guy goes, we're all basically dumber for what you just said. Right. Like, cause it's, it's like this long tirade of stuff. And you're like, they said a lot, but they didn't communicate anything. Yeah, And we do that a lot when we're new to the business and we don't understand it is we'll send paragraphs of information to a contracting officer who has 250 emails in their inbox. And if they open it and they see there's six paragraphs or there's a really generic subject line, like, you know, I'm, or whatever, like it's, it's an eight or 10 word subject line too. Right. You know? And so they see it and they're like, I, man, this is a hassle. I don't have time for this. Right. I don't even know what they're asking or they're asking 11 questions that all have four subparts. I don't have time. Yeah. For this. Yeah. I, I think that's a problem is they don't know what 
activities to do, and then they don't know how to do them effectively. And yeah. that's why a lot of people don't do pre-acquisition, throw up their hands and say, well, we're just going to bid on stuff. We'll see what yeah. happens. Yep, absolutely. And you don't have to do it that way. So uh, I'm glad for those who joined us today, we're having this conversation because there's definitely a better way to do things. And so, Justin, let's go to you. What are you seeing in this? I mean, do you have an estimate about like, you know, how often that may be the case? Uh, I know there's may not be an exact science to this. I yeah. really feel like that there's a m- more of the time it, it, that would ha- would be the case. And in fact, when I was you know, looking at your website was the last time I, I, I really re- was reminded about that statement because you, you made mention of it um, with, I, I think, maybe the forecasting and stuff that you guys have there. But you want to kind of talk about your perspective on this? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think I'm completely right. I mean, depending on how you measure it, we've measured it in different ways. You know, it's between 10 percent um, to 50 percent of opportunities get posted on SAM. It's probably for most people going to be closer to that, like 10, 20 percent range. So you're already if that's sort of where your focus is, it's already going to kind of be on a on a smaller um, on a smaller number there. And, you know, we find that most larger contractors, you know, they're looking 18 months out at the earliest, 18 months to, to three years, uh, if you're talking like $100 million plus contractors, and that's who you're competing with on, on a yeah. lot of these things. And so shaping things with contracting officers for, for 18 months, if they've been talking to partners and building a team for 18 months, if they've been preparing proposal documents for 18 months, you know, they're going to have a, a big advantage versus someone who's kind of coming in, you know, the two weeks before, before things come out. And there, there's other things you can do. Um, like we recommend a lot of times, you know, if it's something that was maybe previously under a vehicle and isn't going to be under a vehicle anymore, or, you know, has some sort of recompete, but it was, you know, the prior version of those documents were not publicly released, do a FOIA request to get those documents. That process takes three to six months. If you're looking two weeks or three weeks before to try to get, you know, more insight there, it's just going to be too late. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you you hit the point on the head about something. And this is something I also mentioned to folks is the lead time on this, right? I mean, you mentioned $100 million companies are looking at contracts valued at that 18 months to three years of a lead time. And, and we talk about that as well. And it's not just related to those huge you know, contracts and the huge contract doors. For example, you know, when I was doing construction contracting at the VA, right? We had like a $50 million contract, but really the range of the task orders within that contract was 2000 to $2 million. So if you were saying that, hey, I just want these $100,000 jobs or, you know, anything between 100000 and $2 million, you really, you got to win the $50 million contract to get into the vehicle so that you can be a competitor inside of that game. So that's kind of how it works for those who aren't very up to speed on the contract vehicles. And this is really one of the most important pieces, I think, again, where that statement is most relevant is these big contract vehicles that people don't understand how they work. People don't understand that got to get into those vehicles to really even be a player at a lot of levels. So what typically happens is that if you're just watching sam.gov to get that opportunity and all of a sudden boom here it is five year contract a 50 year or 50 million or 100 million dollar contract over five years and now you're just trying to ramp up i've seen it firsthand where a lot of clients are looking at that and like oh, i can't do that you know because i don't have this i don't have this i don't have this and this is where that pre-acquisition and pre-engagement work that we always talk about really comes into play so that you can actually get up to speed and not have it only be the first time you're looking at the opportunity. One of the things I really like about your platform, Justin, is that, you know, I've got some webinars where we teach folks on how to go through and use market research, use the data in usaspending.gov, fpds.gov, and a few other ways to help just show people how they can essentially create their own government market forecast because the government has some forecast but those don't always capture everything, right? So there's a way that folks can go and create their own forecasts. And I can show how we do that on some of these webinars. But while those databases are free, it definitely takes a little bit of understanding what you're looking for. And I can imagine sometimes when I teach this, I'm wondering, you know, how many people are able to put this into play 
because I've done this a lot, you know, but even when I do it, sometimes it will take me a while. And the main thing that I, I tell people to do in a lot of sessions is to go and look for a, a historical competition that you can study so that you can maybe get the old solicitation document, read that solicitation document. Because a lot of times what happened in the past will look a lot like what might happen in the future. Of course, there may be some changes, but a lot of the requirements, those little special things they get you that you never saw come in like, oh, I didn't know that I had to have this qualification standard or this training done or this special certification to be eligible, right? And so a lot of times these special requirements that I call showstoppers when people are only seeing that as well in the in the SAM opportunity, sometimes there's not enough time to get all of that stuff done within the window of a given solicitation. The other thing that we talk a lot about is teaming. So if all of a sudden you realize that you cannot go this alone and you might need a teaming or a joint venture partner, well, that's probably also not going to get done within the confines of these short solicitation windows. So I see the IDIQ type contracts, you know, those five-year, multi-year contracts that sometimes only come open uh, once every five years for competition, as opposed to some of the, the federal supply schedules, which are usually open and can get in there. These are the things that I try to, to really preach about and, and to teach about. Justin, uh, can you talk a little, and the reason why I say I signed up for HireGov is because I'm sitting here doing all of this stuff manually, jumping from one database to the other. And I'm like, I kept seeing HireGov pop up when I would just, sometimes I, I would Google an award document and you guys have some good information that came up just off of a Google search of an award document, maybe better than what I was finding inside of the systems. So with forecasting being so important, can you talk about a, a couple of tools that you guys have built in over there to really help people see things that are coming down the road if they want to take this approach to, to plan like 18 months to two years in advance? They, they know maybe that they're going to get, they want to go after the IDIQ contracts, right? But how do you see these things coming? And then also, how do you know if you're going to be competitive on some of these based upon who was the incumbent, who might not be the incumbent in the future, et cetera. I think you guys have some pretty cool things over there. You want to talk about those for a second? Yeah, sure. I mean, we, we sort of tend to recommend a multi-prong approach to building a, a you know, forecast. First, we would recommend looking at the federal forecasts. Unfortunately, the, the difficult part of looking at the federal forecasts is it's unlike SAM, which is one site, there's, it's spread across around 50 different sites. Every agency and a lot of sub agencies have their own sites where they put up their forecasts. Some of them, you know, like DHS have like a pretty good system where you where they update it, you know, on a pretty much daily basis on what's going on. A lot of agencies, particularly in the DOD, they put a spreadsheet out once a year if you're lucky. And so, you know, finding the, getting all that data kind of together and figuring out what's kind of relevant for you. We have that kind of, you know, packaged all together. But, you know, looking at those forecasts where the government sort of explicitly said, hey, this is a new thing we're planning on procuring, or hey, this is a recompete of something we're planning on procuring. There are the forecasts, as Kelly sort of alluded to, are, are not complete, particularly on products. Uh, they don't necessarily do a good job. A lot of sole source stuff isn't in there. A lot of smaller stuff in general just doesn't end up in the forecasts. Or, you know, we see they forecast things after they've already awarded them. It's just, it, it's, it's often, it's not sort of a complete source. So the second thing we tend to tend to look at is just you know looking at existing contracts, what's ending in the next year. I and mean, we have some tools that do that sort of on an automatic basis and then also weed out some stuff we think isn't likely to actually recompete. And that also allows you to get kind of the vehicle stuff and the sole source stuff, you know, as as well as you know, a lot of a lot of smaller, smaller items. We'll recommend tailoring that to, you know, don't just kind of put in your NAICS codes and see what's ending in the next year. Put in your NAICS codes, put in your set asides, your target agencies, really kind of narrow that list down as much as you can to the things that are going to be most relevant. One of the things that's sort of within that we recommend looking at is what we call vulnerable incumbents, which are companies situations where we know the current incumbent cannot rewin that contract. Two major buckets we put that into are because companies that have sized out. So, you know, the, the size threshold on a contract, next size threshold on a contract is $30 million. And we look and say, okay, this company has had $50 million on average in revenue over the last three or five years. We know they can't uh, recompete for that contract anymore. So that's one, you know, that you might want to pay particular attention to when that comes back out to recompete. The other one is if you have 8A or access to 8A is looking at vulnerable 8A would be when, you know, the current 8A is going to be graduating from the 8A program before that contract ends. So they cannot recompete for that contract. So those are some of the, yeah, some of the primary routes. We're also increasingly encouraging people 
it's kind of gone from a good to have, I think, to increasingly need to have on, on the GSA schedule, um, which we allow people to, to integrate their, their e-buys in, into our system to get all that data. Because we found just increasingly, uh, we recently ran some data on, on every e-buy solicitation across all the different SINs over the last four years. And there's been 60,000 requests for information put out on e-buy that were not put out to the general public. And the GSA has a market research service. So if an agency comes and says, hey, we want to understand who can do this in the market, it's only going on to it's only going on to eBuy. It's not going on to Sam. It's not going out elsewhere. And so you have to have access to that um, in order to get access to those, those types of things. Which often will, if they don't immediately result in a reward, will result in you know an award in three to six months because the government's trying to learn learn more information. You can't be part of that discussion early on if you're not on that on that schedule. Sort of the the key for the things there. And so for, no, for people who don't know, eBuy is just the name of the system um, that you get access to. Um, if you're on a on a multiple award schedule, it's where basically the GSA posts items that are exclusive to people that hold uh, GSA schedules. Yeah, quick question for you on that because I know that a lot of people, and we talk about the importance of doing the market research really before you just jump on to GSA schedules, right? Mm-hmm. Because I saw a number somewhere like 52% of small businesses usually will lose their contract after the first Mm -hmm. couple of years because of the lack of that making the minimum sales requirements. So if I'm doing some market research, trying to ascertain whether or not might hit that amount, and taking that step, is there some tools? I mean, you said you mentioned that you can get some visibility on the e-buy stuff. Is there a way a contractor may be able to come in there and say, okay, well, there's here's what I do and, and here's kind of where there yeah. has been a lot of e-buy. Now I can yeah. see like I can compete at this price on these things if I get into the system and get it and I do decide to go with GSA as an option. Yeah, and you're and you're right. I, I would I would recommend that the GSA schedule is probably not the first thing you should do. You should sort of figure out get your sea legs first before you go into that. Yeah, because if you don't hit those minimum those minimum dollar numbers, you'll you'll get kicked out. One option is to get some, somewhat work around that is basically to partner with someone where you can bring some, and then they can help share some of those opportunities with you as 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 they're relevant and sort of as sort of a precursor. So there there's a couple of different uh, things you can do here. One thing which actually we are releasing, I'm um, hoping here in the next couple of weeks, basically. We have acquired from GSA every, as is the same data stuff she's talking about, but basically every solicitation that's come out in the last four years, and we're going to be posting at least the titles of that information under all of our, on our multiple of uh, the SIN pages on our site. So you'll be able to kind of see, um, okay, what types of contracts are coming out under these different um, SINs, which are just sort of the different categories when you apply for a multiple word schedule, you have to apply for certain SINs, which roughly align with NAICS codes. The other thing I may mean, recommend looking at is just looking at historical award data for what's coming out under under the the GSA you know uh, schedule 1050 um, and then the GSA schedules because you'll see that the amount has has grown um, significantly over time in terms of how much money is flowing through there particularly in certain NAICS codes it's more than others you know relative to particularly you know we see a lot in, like the technology in particular where you see less and less I feel like going on to SAM and more and more going through the GSA schedule particularly on like technology service or other vehicles for technology services a lot of products purchases that I would say are re- you know high volume type product purchases, those tend to also go through the GSA schedule rather than every single time the government wants to buy something, they're putting out a, yeah. something on, on, on SAM for those. So going and doing the research and saying, okay, what historically has been coming out under these vehicles, and in particular, what's been coming out under these vehicles and the NAICS codes that are relative to me, and then figuring out, okay, looking and seeing if you can find sort of specific solicitations that have come out that, okay, those were things I really would have liked to participate in, but I wasn't able to participate in because you know I, I couldn't there. And I guess I'd say as a a third sort of check would be looking at pricing. You whether it's a GSA schedule or labor pricing or product pricing. Product pricing you can find on uh, the GSA Advantage website, which is a publicly available website. You can see what other people are pricing. Um, there's like uh, tens of millions of products available on there. How people are pricing those products, um, and you can see if you're competitive, you know, and what you'd be able to price those products as. In terms of labor pricing, um, the GSA has a tool called GSA Calc, which you can use to see other people's uh, labor prices. We have a, our own tool that's a little bit more robust and has significantly more price points than they do, but the GSA Calc is a free tool you can use uh, that will show you what, how other people are pricing their sort of rates on, on the GSA schedule for various sins, and you can kind of see, all right, am I in the 25th percentile, am I in the 75th percentile, am I going to be competitive coming in there at whatever pricing you know I'm able to do? It's awesome, man. That- 
I'm a relatively new subscriber and I haven't had an opportunity to dive into everything yet, but it's really cool what you've built there. And uh, I saw a couple of folks in the chat ask if you could put your business information in, in the chat for them. And for those of you guys who are watching this streaming, again, I mentioned this earlier in the housekeeping, but if uh, you want to go and check out uh, Justin's uh, platform, it's Hire Gov, Hire Gov, H I G H E R, gov.com. I believe you do have a, a free trial as well there, uh, don't you, Justin? Yeah, I have a two week free trial. Awesome. Yeah, definitely check it out. Michael, I want to come back to you and, and, and something Justin said that very interesting to me about the platform. And I know there's a way that you can look at some of this stuff. And, and again, it might be harder to find who is the incumbents out there and, and even harder to find who are those vulnerable incumbents. incumbents. And we've seen numbers. I, and, I, and Justin, I, I don't know if you have any numbers on this, but you know, I've seen somebody somewhere say, I believe that incumbents have about a 70% chance of winning the recompete, right? So when you are looking at something like what Justin uh, refers to as a vulnerable incumbent, knowing that this contractor, if they're not going to be eligible for recompete, what are they going to do? If they're smart, they're probably going to partner up with a newer small business if they've sized out of the size standards or in the case of an 8A contractor, right? Partnering up with a newer up and coming contractor so that, yeah, they'd not be eligible for that recompete, but at least they could still have a piece of that business. Michael, do you see that a lot for the folks, some of the folks that you work with that are looking to do teaming and, you know, where are they coming in in terms of being able to find some of these incumbent contractors that they can partner up with? Well, I would say that for the most part, I would classify that as a more advanced strategy than yeah. the average person that's doing government contracting. Like like the the newbies to government contracting, if you will, that may not have even occurred to them. So yeah. it's like it's it's usually more of an advanced strategy to say, oh, well, this person is not going to be able to recompete this for one of these other reasons. And yeah. I think it's a strategy more people should be using, you right. know, but it, it it's more of an advanced strategy where a lot of people are coming in. And that first three to five years you're in the market, that may not even occur to you. Your whole thing, because you're just trying to figure out how the market works and trying to win something. Mm -hmm. And teaming is actually one of those things where while I don't feel like it's an advanced strategy, it is an advanced strategy for people to do more teaming where yeah. they have a teaming stable of companies. They have ones that they're using as subs. They have ones that they have as their primes and they have a strategy for how they're approaching things. That That is a more advanced strategy than the average newbie to the market. Again, the newbie to the market typically wants to be a prime. Like I want yeah. a prime. I don't need anybody else. And I want to look for contracts that I can do on my own. That's yeah. often the strategy. And then as they get in and start figuring it out, they realize, oh, this gets easier when you have teaming partners. So we're trying to push those advanced strategies to the front of the line and say, look, this will make life easier on everybody on your team. Your win percentage is going to go up. The workload is going to go down by now you're spreading it amongst your teaming partners for writing the proposal and all that. The intelligence gathering, you're going to have more intel if you're, if you're choosing the right partners. So I think they're great strategies to use. And if anything, if you're on this call and you've either not heard about that, or it sounds, you know, like, Hey, it sounds like difficult. These are the strategies that separate the, I don't want to say losers from the winners, but it's often what it is, right? It, it's, it's the companies that are struggling versus the companies that are thriving. That's a good yeah. way to put it. They're implementing these advanced strategies where they're looking at that type of information. And again, it goes back to what I said earlier they're not having to bid on 20 opportunities. So yeah, if you can use these advanced strategies, you can accelerate your growth by giving yourself a better chance and having less workload. And that's initially what it's about when you're starting because you don't necessarily have 300 people on your team. Because I can think of some of the things that Justin said, some people may say, well, that's for when I'm $100 million and I may never get to $100 million. No, that's in the beginning. If yeah. you're using these strategies now, that gives you a better chance of eventually getting to a hundred million, right? Because if you're starting out and you're not using these strategies, 
the odds are you get in this market and you flounder for three to five years and then leave it. That's what happens. The same thing with the GSA schedule. The reason the failure rate on GSA is so high is not because the program is broken. It's because people don't know how to use it. They do two things wrong. They don't look at who they're actually selling to and how those people are buying. And two, they think that once you have it, it's like Amazon and you're going to have 7 million eyeballs looking at your stuff every day. And that's not true. You've still got a market on it. it. The ones that market and the ones that choose it because their customers are buying are the ones that are winning. And that's just the, the bottom line. So the more research you can do on the front end, it just changes everything on the back end. Absolutely. And um, yeah, I'm glad you talked about that, uh, Michael. Is It is kind of an advanced strategy, but really, it really shouldn't be, right? With regards to teaming and, and the, everything that we're really talking about, you know, we're, right now we're talking about advanced prospecting, forecasting, and, and teaming. And by the way, folks, uh, we do have some good trainings on that on Govology. If you just go to our on-demand section, we have something on forecasting. We have stuff on prospecting, a lot on market research. But again, I think that tools like uh, you know what Justin's built at HireGov can make your efforts a little bit more streamlined to, to find what you're looking for. And so I want to also go back to one more thing as it relates to teaming and that was with regards to what Justin said about that that lead time, that window of 18 months to three years. Sometimes people are looking at things, but I know, Michael, that uh, you know a lot of uh, what you teach and what Josh teaches in your coaching sessions and in your trainings and what you guys do is also getting on as a subcontractor. And a lot of times those subcontractor relationships now turn into a relationship where it might flip over when that teamy partner is not able to actually go after maybe yeah. a small business set aside where you have that ability to. But again, even if you had time to basically do it, some type of a teaming or a joint venture deal within the framework of a short solicitation window, you're likely not going to get it done because it's also a relationship development piece. And folks are going to say, hey, you know, let's date before we get married. Let's do some kind of work together first. You know, and this is what a lot of folks want to do. So now you add that into your timeline, right? You got partner that you want to develop a relationship with down the road for an opportunity that may happen in two years. But what can you do right now? So when I think about opportunities in the government marketplace, I'm not really just thinking about what's hitting Sam. I'm thinking about, here's what I'm seeing on the market research systems that are out there and available. Those are opportunities, right? Because they're, they're going to be continue to be opportunities in the future. And if it's anything that's within GSA's federal supply schedules or some type of an agency-specific IDIQ contract, that means that there's recurring demand if the government put it in these right. contract vehicles. It means they buy it a lot and they're going to continue to buy it a lot in the future. And this is what everyone should think about with regards to opportunity. Think about how you can start to see and find some of the opportunity that is out there using these market research uh, platforms. One of the things uh, I want to say with regards to uh, Justin's platform that I really liked about it is that with some of the other market research platforms that are out there, I, I've tested a few of them. And number one, I, I didn't even really see exactly what I was looking for, which is related to some of those forecasted ops, some of those uh, vulnerable incumbents, as uh, uh, Justin mentioned. But the other thing about it is that the pricing on most were really within the range of like 3000 to to up to 20000 for some of the more expensive systems out there. And uh, Justin, uh, and I mentioned this to Justin on a, a call we had, because uh, when I did a demo, uh, Justin showed up and I said, hey, I really appreciate what you guys are doing out there. And I think your, your base level subscription right now for a single user is uh, 500 uh, per year. That's amazing. And I really appreciate that because you know, small businesses out there, you know, they don't, sometimes they don't have a lot of funds up at the front, but I love the businesses who create that model where it's like they have something for small businesses that can get started. And then as you go, there may be more licenses you want to add or, or whatnot. I'm not a salesperson for hire gov, uh, just is not giving me commission, but I just, when I find good resources like hire gov and like the stuff that Michael and Josh are doing at, at uh, federal access, just love to bring those to the forefront. So thank both of you guys for, for what you're doing for the small business community out there. Justin, do you have any uh, other 
tips or anything else with regards to folks being able to find opportunities in advance? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I guess I mean, I'll sort of add on to the the, uh, the subcontracting piece, which we again think is is very important. I mean, if you it's it's unfortunately the data's government on subcontracting is is very bad, so it's hard to get like an exact number. But basically, the numbers we sort of you know pull together and, and clean, we see sort of you know we think the subcontracting market has roughly doubled in the last ten years, from roughly fifty billion dollars a year to around a hundred plus billion dollars a year at least. And a good chunk of that is going to, to to small businesses. I mean, if you look at the the money that's going to small businesses, I mean, it's probably getting close to 50 50 uh, subcontract versus versus prime. And we're seeing more and more just kind of you know pure subcontract small businesses, well contractors that don't even really look to prime, that just fully focus on fully focus on subcontracting. So I would not necessarily limit yourself when you're looking at recompetes to looking at recompetes of prime opportunities. Subcontracts more than $25,000 are generally disclosed. Um, they'll be available in tools like USA Spending. And again, they're, they're in our tool as well. So going and looking at uh, subcontracts that might be coming up for, for recompete over the next uh, year or two is also an option. Looking at if there are companies that you're looking to potentially partner with their primes that are in your key area, look at who they're subcontracting with today. And if there are folks that you could potentially displace or supplement, that is useful, you know, when in those sort of sort of conversations. And really, you know, market yourself to that market. We we did a survey kind of looking to see uh, for some of our larger contractors on our platform, you know, what do you why do you use subcontractors? 81%, this is we they could answer more than one thing, but 81% said for socioeconomic certifications. 71% 71% said for capabilities, 56% said for past performance, 32% said for lower labor costs. So those primes are primarily looking for either they need uh, to hit their small business targets or 8A targets or SDVOSP targets, et cetera. They need to have a capability they don't, they, they have a capability need that they can't meet, or they're looking for some sort of past performance. You have like experience with an agency or something like that, that, that they don't have. And whereas, you know, things like lower costs or, you know, scale or geography, all those sorts of things tend not to matter quite as much. So, you know, don't, you, you can think about, you know, prime, uh, you know, when we encourage people, prime relationships should, you should, or, uh, you know, prime sub relationships you should think of as multi-year type things where you're going and you're, you're pursuing multiple things with people, but uh, you know, you you should a lot of times when either figure out who you should partner with or how to approach that partnership. Really, the data and the approaches should not be that different in our view from how you approach prime contracting. You should be marketing yourself with with the things that you have that are special to those prime contractors. You should be looking at subcontracts that have been recently awarded. You should be looking at subcontracts that are coming up for repeat. It, that's all. It's 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 part of the uh, an important part of the strategy um, as well. Awesome. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and I tell folks often in, in some of the marketing and sales trainings that we have is that, you know, don't forget about the good old fashioned marketing and sales 101 that might have been working for you previously if you were doing business outside of the, the government marketplace. Because I think some people kind of have this thought that, like, hey, I got to go register at SAM and watch the things, hit my email box, and that's the only opportunity. But as you guys, that are listening in today hopefully have seen there's a there's a lot of uh, people and there's a lot of the savvy businesses out there that are going out there doing the, their research doing their homework and, and then making the connections for opportunities together and and i think that for a lot of contractors it's all really about alliances and really either you, you know you're on a team or you know you're leading a team and this is one of the ways that a lot of people are, are winning in the government marketplace. Mike, I'll give you some final thoughts on this and then uh, we'll break and we'll go to the q and I think I saw a lot of things popping up as we were talking, but uh, oh, how, awesome. wrap it up for us. Yeah, yeah. you know, so I, I think if we just go back to the, the first time you saw it on Sam, it's too late, Is that is absolutely true. It's absolutely true. Most of the time it's going to be too late for various reasons. We've mentioned a lot of them today, whether it's you don't know the customer, you're not ready, you don't have the time to put together the relationships, the JVs, the whatever it is. And, and you know, people look at the JV thing and think, well, that's easy to do. Well, you got to open a bank account. You got to put together some documents. You got to register. If you're in the 8A program, you got to get things approved. There's all these kind of things that can trip you up and people have to agree on them and all that kind of stuff. And so that's why if that's the only place you're hunting, you're going to run into a problem. You're not going to put enough opportunities in the pipeline to chase. And I'll, I'll give folks this strategy here. If you want to be to reach out to people 
as a sub to team, you could probably make a hundred phone calls a month to different companies asking them to team on contracts that were recently awarded. Because if it is a, a butts in seats type of contract, mostly services, not necessarily on the product side as much, but still on their side. If it's a butts and seats, a services type of, of project, I don't know a single client of ours that bids a contract with 100% of the labor involved, unless it's like a one or two person FTE type of thing, right? If it's five or more, there's a good chance they're going to bid it, win it, and try to figure it out on the back end. Happens all the time. And if you're looking at recently awarded contracts that are 10, 12, $20 million and reaching out to these people that are in your, they're targeting your agencies, they're in your niche and saying, Hey, congratulations on that 10, $12 million contract. If you're like everybody else, you're probably short one or two of those FTEs and we could help you with that. That could be the start of a new relationship with them where you now could be a sub on that contract at the end of the day. Cause at the end of the day, why do people team with you? It's to get the job done. A lot of the reasons that Justin mentioned, but it's to get the job done. And if they can't find an FTE that's going to get approved by the, the client, that's not getting the job done. So th there's a simple strategy right there that can help you get the job done and help you get that first date, if you will, with yeah. that potential teaming partner. And so it's not viable to only have a bid on Sam type of strategy. You need a bigger, broader strategy that's looking at more things. And that's what I think. Well, thank you, Michael. And uh, before we go, I actually I had one more thing I wanted to add there that I would encourage you guys to do maybe as a practice and a challenge, if you will. So uh, let's just say you do see something on sam.gov that for some reason or other, you just don't have the resources, the time, capacity, or whatever it is that you can't go after it. Don't throw those opportunities away. Think about this. An opportunity like that will probably come again relatively soon at some point in time. But go through the process of practicing to see, hey, you know, can you bid on this opportunity? What precludes you from proposing or putting in an offer on this opportunity? And also work with your Apex Accelerator counselor to help to gear you up so that if it was on the street today and you had 30 days to go, you have everything that you need to get it done. And a lot of times by looking at what has been historically competed, you can start to develop a content library. So a lot of your content can kind of already be good to go. You can start though looking at also those little special requirements. Like again, if, if the government says, hey, you need to have an approved accounting system or you need to have this or you need to have that. These are things that you could work on getting. If there's some things that you don't understand, again, now you have time and I know that a lot of the Apex Accelerator counselors, formerly known as PTACs across the country, are, are a great resource, but they're also very overwhelmed. And probably especially after they started making a little banner ad on every solicitation, I can imagine that everybody's like calling people up. Hey, the government said you can help me out here. But again, these folks have limited time and, and availability, right? So if you can start to work with them on things that you are seeing and preparing for those types of things to say, hey, I'm going to act like this is a live solicitation and develop a full proposal, get every piece I need. The next time that comes around, you'll probably have already 80% of the work done and mitigated all of the risk on getting kicked off or, or not being able to pursue it because all of a sudden there's one of these things that kind of it was a surprise factor to you. So that's the last I want to uh, mention on that. Uh, I thank everybody who's tuned in with us on this episode. And we'll see you on the next one. And thank you for joining us. I'd like to take a little pause now and pull up the Q&A here for today. And it looked like it was pretty active. So let me pull that up. And uh, Justin, again, thank you for being with us today. Great information. Let's see what we got for the questions. I can jump in and take the yeah. If you can help me one. out there, Michael. So one of the ones is the uh, the president one there, where people are always concerned about the election. And I I'll tell you, people, it doesn't really matter what's going on election wise. There's a somewhat of a pause during the cycle, especially when we know the president's going to change hands. So if you've had a president that they're wrapping up their second term, you know it's going to be a new president coming in, right? When you're in a situation like we have right now where a lot of people are saying 
I don't know what's going to happen, right? You start to see some uncertainty in the market and it starts usually around midsummer and it'll carry on until about February or March after the election. And the reason is that first hundred days when a new president gets in, there's a lot of uncertainty. People don't know which directions are going to go. But overall, here's the deal. Doesn't matter which side of the platform they are on. There's so many things in the government that are very consistent. Our military is not going anywhere. It may size up or down. Department of Commerce, not going anywhere. Some things are going to size up or down. Uh, Homeland Security, some things are going to size up or size down. There's so many of those things out there. And a lot of them, those budget cycles have been put in place months, if not years. That's why there's five-year contracts that are out there and all this kind of stuff. There's such a minimal impact from the president changing hands. That's why this market is so stable. Now, you will see initiatives where some things will get cut and that'll go into the next, next budgeting cycle. New things will get introduced because especially when you have a new president in, again, doesn't matter what party, they have an agenda. That's why they came in. That's the platform that got them elected. They're going to bring those things to the table. So you'll see some new things. They'll decide to cut some things. But for the most part, the show must go on. And so I think too many people get wrapped up in the election cycle and take a pause, kind of step back. But you should really be moving forward. In fact, to me, the time where you should step in is when the rest of the people in the market are taking a step back because now there's less noise in the market. There's less people hammering those contracting officers. So instead of that contracting officer having 250 emails in their inbox, maybe they only have 75. And so it's easier to get a hold of people when that kind of stuff is going on and put your company out front. So I don't mind those times. The show must go on. And so don't look at that as, hey, this is going to change political hands. And is it going to drastically impact my ability to get in the market? The odds are probably not. It's probably not going to impact a whole lot. So, All right. Justin, what are your thoughts on presidential elections? And, and then I'll ask you a second part, which is a question that somebody submitted for you, asking if your tool is good to gather insights in regards to DIBS competitive analysis. DIBS, by the way, for those folks that don't know, is the DLA's bid board for a lot of their repetitive buys. So go ahead, Justin. Yeah, I, I agree completely with uh, with with Michael um, on that. I mean, the the president usually minimal impact. I mean, you never know what's going to happen, but usually that that's relatively relatively minimal impact. I mean, usually those sorts of things will tend to maybe cause delays. Um, I know I in the past we've seen delays just because you know people haven't been appointed, and so that's holding things up and, and whatnot. So I mean, we can often see sort of delay things to maybe get pushed further to the right than usual around elections, stuff like that. Generally speaking. Congress is, is usually more more of what I would worry about in, in that in terms of and where where money sort of more sort of gets shifted. So I mean I, I think that it's not that it can have an impact. I think to a large extent it's just it, sure it can have an impact, but you can't really predict it. So it's not really worth yeah. wor- worrying about all that much unless you know you're Raytheon or Lockheed Martin or something, and you know one one candidate has proposes your over over another for most small to medium. When you when you funded the campaigns, it might make a difference. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Carol, there was a clarification to that question about it being more about the continuing resolutions. Here's the deal. That is just the the budget getting extended. And we've been in this cycle for as long as I've been in government contracting. And there's always the threat of a shutdown. I think the largest shutdown in my government career was 2019 for 34 days. The average shutdown is three to five days. Here again, Mike's view on this. It is a wonderful political tool that riles up an audience, right? It riles up both sides, which as we're going into the election side, both sides want to rile up each other's sides. And this is like the WCW on steroids when you get into, for those who don't know, that's, you know, the uh, like professional wrestling, I think it's WWE now or whatever the heck it is, right? It is Hollywood on steroids when you watch them fighting over the budgets and all that kind of garbage and they do a shutdown for a couple of days or whatever it is. But for the most part, those things are going to get signed. They just are. Are they going to get signed in December? Are they going to get signed in January? Are they going to get signed in March? I don't know the answer to that. They're going to get signed. Are we going to kick the can down the road three or four times in between that? 
possibly, <laughs> you know, it happens. It, it is the one boogeyman that pops up literally every year for three to six months, maybe even more. Um, and it literally goes nowhere. It's just a really good political tool. So the government's still spending money. I went back and looked over the last several decades at the at what money was being spent during the shutdown, and it was as much or more during those shutdown windows. Business is still going on. The show must go on. And so, again, if you remove yourself from the political drama and look at the data, which Justin can probably provide, you'll be able to look at it and go, oh, this is just a lot of drama. Let's keep moving on. Let's keep doing business. Thanks, Michael. Dustin, I'll come back to you on the Dibs competitive analysis question. I mean, this is only really applicable to folks that are are kind of in that in that DLA market, specifically, you know, sustainment market. We we fully integrate with Dibs. We also pull in uh, pricing and, and stuff from every award and and FedMall and and a bunch of a couple other kind of GSA, a couple other kind of random sources out there. So if you're looking at like a particular NSN or something, you can see, uh, you know, what the historical pricing has been, how many people bid, what the set aside was, so you can get an idea of, you know, is this something that's worth bidding on based on, you know, how level of competition and, and pricing is. Historically, and we also have a few tools for things like finding. And the, the very common thing that is is somewhat unique to the the dibs market. So there is a, a large percentage of contract opportunities uh, that just no one bids on, and so they go unawarded. I think right now there are and things past due. 15 to 90 days without without any award it's 36,000 opportunities so those are just constantly those so we have tools for finding those and like what the most attractive PSD codes are and stuff like that sort of finding those those pockets of pockets of information and, and the DLA it, it could be a little bit of a, a market for those who aren't familiar with it a little bit of a, a intimidating market because the the DLA has does those things the way the DLA does things but it's also the DLA very much wants to work with folks and get more people in there and there's a lot of a lot, a lot, a lot of low hanging in, in that market for folks that are interested in kind of distribution and or have manufacturing capabilities and can supply uh, the DLA. All right, there you have it. And a couple of more. Uh, somebody asked about how to watch this information again. So this is streaming to our YouTube channel. If you go to Govology, find our YouTube channel. Also, if you go to govology.com forward slash issues, once we get this show edited, we'll post it back there as well as, as the last episode. There's another question. Is there a minimum response time for RFPs, RFQs on SAM? For example, all postings must allow at least 30 days for responses question. So that, that was a question. And I know that there are some FAR requirements depending upon which acquisition you're talking about. If you're doing you know, construction, we know that like I've seen a lot of super short windows around commercial item acquisitions. You know, Justin, do you guys, from a numbers perspective, I mean, is there an average like time frame of all solicitations that you would say yeah. like if this was here's the average yeah we actually tried to calculate that once and then there's just, it's just like a it's a complete nonsensical output of that i thought i mean i go before you know i guess i was too busy looking at FARC. i thought it was two weeks was sort of like the the minimum requirement but yeah for a lot of things we'll see you know they put it out on a saturday it's due on like a monday yeah. for like some some, you know, some of those commercial type items okay. certainly are things like, you know, where it's like large vehicles or things where they're looking for industry outreach where it can, it can take, it can be a year uh, between when the pre-solicitation comes out to the solicitation. So it really does, does range widely. I mean, I'd say for your kind of like median, here's a solicitation, give it to us. I mean, it's typically two weeks to, to 30 days, but that can be, you know, two days, that can be a year. Um, it just, it really just kind of depends on the, on, on the yeah. FAR that's applicable and all the details there. And then just, you know, how much the, the con I think a lot of times it just comes down to the contracting officer if, if they know if they if this is basically a sole source that's not really a sole source they'll make it shorter if it's something where they they want you know they want or need genuine competition they'll make it longer yeah it's exactly what we've seen same thing so it's it's all over the map so Carol there's there's one question I'd like to answer and then I have yep. to hop off to get on another call here um, somebody asked about most CEOs are not product specialists in our experience uh, wouldn't it be better to market to the ultimate government end users how can we do that effectively so here's the thing you have to to understand every agency is going to be different every single one and even within that there's subsets of people that are influencers and so it depends on who the influencers are I've I've had situations where we're selling to a client and there was a CEO who was an 
involved as the the program managers, right? They were so involved with everything we're going on. And then I've had others where they're like, Hey, I only, you know, process what comes across my desk. I got no idea. <laughs> right. And there's like, there's Bob over here. Who's a program manager that anything he wants, Bob gets, and, and he's really running the show. So uh, Judy Bratt coined this phrase years ago. She talks about the players and layers. I uh, just did a, a a podcast about that recently as well, where when you are doing that research, you'll find out who the players are at different layers. And there's your CEOs, there's your small business reps there. Cause I've had small business reps. Like the one that comes to mind is the one at Scott air force base where they see an opportunity come out and they know the contracting officer hasn't done their due diligence in the small business area. They go right into that office and say, no, 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 no. There are four WSBs that could do this opportunity. Why didn't you put it out that way? And they will use their influence to make that happen. So it really depends who you're targeting, who those influencers are. But I say what you want to do is get to know all of the people at those layers. So when you're selling to somebody and we, we obviously we can't go into a lot of detail about that here, but just know that there's multiple layers, not just the CEO, not just a small business rep. There's probably some project managers, program managers, end users. There's a lot of different people that could influence what you are selling, especially based on the, the price point. If you're selling a low price point, it may be end users who can swipe a, gro- a government credit card and buy that stuff from you. You don't even need to go to a CEO, right? So you may not need to speak to those people. So there's a lot of different ways to do that, but there's there's many different layers depending on, on who you sell. So I just wanted to point that out. And I know we have one more question. Justin, you got to run or you got time for one more? I got time for one. All right. So let, let's just do this one last one. I think it's a good question. It asks, what about RFQs instead of RFPs for very small businesses? Do you have advice for pre-acquisition that are lower value? I guess opportunities of lower value. And I'll start out with a few thoughts on this because I'm guessing that the person is asking you this is that what about the small stuff, right? You know, and where do you kind of get to be able to take part in that? Well, one, again, we know that like a lot of the small stuff, unfortunately, even though it would be very ideal for small businesses to start participating in some of the small stuff, the problem is that you don't really see it because it doesn't hit the requirement to be publicized at SAM, all right? So under 25,000. And then I'll once that said, within the GSA world itself, federal supply schedules, there's still a lot of these little buys that happen, like individual buys that are very small as well. So I guess in terms of the advice there for the pre-acquisition work, if you're trying to get involved with opportunities that are small, the couple of things that comes to my mind is, one, where is the flow of the opportunity going if you're able to do the research and find out that like, hey, this kind of gets done outside of the contract vehicles. And so if you really want to get your product or your service in front of a buyer, that buyer, like Michael just mentioned the players of the layers might not necessarily be that's going to be the contracting officer, but it may be that it's going to be a departmental purchase done within their the purchase card. So if you know who that person in the market that is your unique buyer, or sometimes they call that the avatar in, in marketing, but the person that's also ultimately going to be the recipient of your product or service, if you can somehow get your product or service in their hands and put it in front of them. I was a supply officer on a Navy ship and I oversaw three purchase card holders. And a lot of times the purchases that would happen was folks would come to our office and they would in the engineering department and the deck department and they would see something in a catalog or something online that they wanted us to purchase for them through the P card. That's one way that, you know, if you think about how a person might look for your product, just by having it out there, just by maybe getting your product on Amazon, you might find out that now you're getting a government purchase card buyer coming to make the buy from you. As it relates, if you're having to see it, a lot of stuff that's going through GSA, federal supply schedules, that's where now that you know that there's an incumbent, but at least now if you're using tools like HireGov and things that would like Justin has built, you can see who those incumbents are 
and approach them and let them know, hey, here's what we offer. And maybe you think about giving them a wholesale discount on your product as a, at a retail level because they've got to go off and resell this as well. Kind of like if you've ever watched the Pawn Stars movie where they're saying like, you know, they're giving folks 50% of what they're going to ultimately sell it for. So you got to always think about at that point, you're offering it up to a prime that they've got to mark it up and have some margin in there as well. Any like thoughts on that particular question, Justin? Um, no, I mean, I think I, I generally agree with that. We sort of recommend one of the things when we're sort of looking at recompetes, one of the ways we'll suggest cutting it is cutting it at, at sole source, looking at smaller things that have been sole source or just had a you know relatively small number of real number of bidders. I find that sometimes the government gets into kind of one of these cycles of where they're kind of just like awarding it to the same person over and over again. Yeah. So you can to break that cycle. We also recommend, you know, particularly whenever you're kind of going into like micro purchases or or a smaller contracts, make sure that your government kind of marketing and profile and all that stuff is is optimized or like your SAM registration as good as it could be is your registration DSBS as good as it could be you know are, are you some agencies have like their own sites like FEMA and NASA have like their own databases making sure you're in like all those kind of kind of right places to, to be you know you got a professional looking website and capability statement and, and, all, and all those sorts of things because that can kind of just help give you credibility when you're kind of going in for, for some of those, uh, those those types of conversations. Yeah. The last part I'll say, Justin, one, one last question for you as it relates to this topic. So let's say a, a contractor, because a lot's going through federal supply schedules these days, you know, and they, they, may, they maybe they're using higher gov and, and they're seeing kind of like some of these buys happening. On, on this different stuff that they're they're doing. And maybe even they got a, a supply schedule themselves. But if you go and read FAR Part 8 uh, for everyone here, it kind of designates the path that the contracting officers should take when looking at making purchases from the schedules. And what you might realize there is that there's a certain point in time where it's like they, they don't really even have to compete it out. I think it's up to the simplified acquisition threshold uh, that they could just say they could survey three vendors, right? So that means that they don't necessarily are required to post everything on, on eBuy. So I, I think the strategy and the, the question for you, Justin, is that as folks see these things coming from eBuy, they've kind of done the work to get on the schedules, but maybe they're they're not getting seen because maybe they're not being looked at or, or the agencies are just going back to the old firm people that used to be all the time in these transactions, what would you recommend for maybe somebody that would be using your platform? Would you say, reach it back out to the contracting officers to make them aware that you're out there and you can also do this opportunity? Yeah, no, that I man, that's a hundred percent, hundred percent it. I, we see this with very large companies as well, where they've, you know, maybe uh, particularly like a commercial side where they maybe offer things to the products where they've just, they've gone out of, they used to, you know, I was talking to a client the other day who was like, they were, they, there were like two or three companies that they used to compete with for everything that kind of lost sight of the government market. And they were trying to come back into it. And they're like, we don't see any solicitations for anything that we do. Like there's just zero solicitations for what we do. And we looked and we saw, well, it's because everything has just been being, you guys left the market. There's only one company doing it. And so everything's just been getting soul sourced over and over again. So you need to identify, find every contract that's been awarded for your products get the, the contracting officer on that and email the contracting officer and say, Here, here's a cable statement, we're just capable of doing this and, and try to get this put back out, put, put that back out to competition because other, otherwise it kind of just gets stuck in this and again, in that sort of sole source yeah. type, type cycle. And that, that's kind of the only way to, to get it out of it. To be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's other approaches, but that's yeah. that, that's the only kind of approach that I'm, I'm aware of is you kind of have to, to get the government out of their, I don't want to say stupor, but their kind of their, their cycle of what, of what they're currently doing. Then that's also one of the reasons why I like your system too, because I mean, if you're looking back at historical transactions, right? I mean, that's a great market opportunity for for folks because you guys have the contracting officer's name and email and phone number right there. I mean, make the opportunities happen for you, right? Pre-acquisition is like everything before acquisition. The proposal phase is just the paperwork phase, but bring about that awareness of your company to those buyers out there that you see buying in the historical system, because now they'll know that you're out there. And uh, if you're a small business or, or whatever, they may not automatically see that with the hundreds of folks that are sometimes on these various contract vehicles and kind of who's doing what when it comes down to a specific name of a specific product or service, it gets very granular. And so it could be even hard for the contracting folks to sometimes find those, I'm guessing. Well, 
That is it. Justin, thank you so much for your time today. And thanks for the extra 15 minutes. I really love, again, the work that you guys are doing out there at HireGov. I think for those of you guys, Justin put his information in the chat. If you want to reach out to him directly or check out their website or check out their free trial. And certainly would love to kind of circle back with you, Justin, at a a later date. Maybe we'll bring you on next year and have you talk some different aspects next time. But uh, hey, thanks again. And uh, Mm -hmm. again, yeah, thank you for what you're doing out there to support the GovCon marketplace. Thank you, Justin. So we're going to wrap it up today. And uh, that's it. Uh, wish everyone a happy holidays and a happy new year. And, and we'll see you again in January and talk to you soon. Take care.